Good morning, everyone. Welcome to La Cunada Congregational Church. I'd like to invite you to worship with us not only today, but throughout the week as we take opportunities to worship God through service. Always on Tuesdays, we serve at McKinley School in Pasadena from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., passing out food to families in need. And then on Wednesdays from 8 a.m. to noon here at the church office, we are collecting non-perishable food items for the Friends Indeed Food Pantry, as well as towels for Door of Hope and their Showers of Hope that they've partnered with. And so I hope in all these ways that you can come and worship God, even though this time that we are in feels tough, frustrating, quite dark for us. We're reminded in Psalm 23, verse 4, how the psalmist will say that even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I pray that we would find that during this time, all the frustration and loneliness, the sense of distance that we feel from one another, is not then a distance that we feel from God, but instead that we would recognize that these are the moments where God's presence is often most made known to us, that God is a God who will draw us out of the darkness of death and despair and into life through God's presence. And so my hope is that you would find God's presence with you this morning in song, in prayer, in teaching, that you would be reminded that God is intimately aware of our own needs, that God is responding to those needs even now as we worship. Like to invite you to pray with me now this prayer of confession let us pray merciful and loving god you are a splendid mystery inviting curiosity and wonder help us to look deeply at your grace awaken our soul to your beauty and presence forgive us when we narrowly focus upon ourselves save us with your amazing grace amen you know so often we can look only to ourselves and our own needs, and yet it is God who draws us beyond that, who helps us to see a world that is beautiful and that is asking us to respond to its needs out of the fullness that God provides. And so I hope that as you find yourself both calling to God this morning in prayer, addressing God with your own concerns and burdens, that you would also see how God is opening your eyes up to the needs of others, and that you would also make mention of them so that God's gifts of grace and mercy that he so wonderfully bestows upon us 
is also found for them as well. And so I'd invite you to take time now to pray for your needs, for the needs around you, and let those needs be filled with a gratitude of knowing that it is God who meets each and every one of them. And so I invite you now to pray. And as we gather back together, let us now pray again together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. We're all making little adjustments to the way we go about our day in light of our stay-at-home orders and the threat of this virus that we are now living in. I'm finding that even the ways that I say goodbye to people is changing. I used to just say, see you later. And now I'm saying, stay safe. And I keep hearing it from other people as we're ending our our online calls or, or phone calls or whatever, that it seems that, that the safety of one another is really what's pressing and what our biggest concern is. And you know, as I'm reflecting on that, I'm wondering, well, has there been times when I've been at risk and I didn't know it? I mean, now it seems that, that everywhere I go, there is a threat of a sneeze or a cough or someone passing too closely without wearing a mask. But did that exist before we were told? Obviously, there was threats around us that were present that we just didn't know about, that our safety and, and very security was at stake and we were oblivious. Paul is going to use this idea of sort of uh, being asleep through a reality that we just didn't know we were in as he continues his thoughts with the Ephesians, now moving into chapter 2. He's going to show them that there was a moment in their life where they were simply dead to the reality of God's goodness, but that in Christ, that death was now called to life. And so we'll look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, as we begin our exploration this morning. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
to be our way of life. So Paul is going to start off with very stark language about the relationship we have with our past. Paul's going to pick up language of death and life to describe just how different our life now is that we have discovered the faithfulness of Christ as it's born into us in love and grace and compassion. Paul's going to say that we were once corrupted that we were living in a reality where the very air itself was so poisonous that it poisoned our own bodies and that death was all that we would have known. It's sort of like uh, how we would come back home after being gone on a long vacation and you notice that your house now has a certain smell. It's always had that smell, but we had gotten used to it at some point. And that's what Paul is saying here is that we've gotten so used to the way the world is that we sort of take it for granted and we expect that that's the way it should be. That we, we don't any longer recognize just how corrupted and violent, how oppressive that our reality is around us. And before we came to faith in Christ, Paul would say is we were caught up into that so much that we didn't even recognize we were in danger. We didn't even recognize that we were at risk, that we needed someone to rescue us from that reality. But instead, we were born into wrath and violence, that we were children of wrath, somehow perpetuating a cycle of oppression and unkindness in this world without even knowing it. And so much of it seems like, well, that's just the way the world is. That's the way the world works. And it would be naive to expect or anticipate anything different. And Paul is saying, see, that's just the problem is that we have all sort of um, colluded together unintentionally with the reality that this is just how the world is supposed to work. But see, in Christ, something different happens. In Christ, we find a transformation happening. And what Paul is going to say is that that's not just a transformation that happens in us, but it's a transfer, transformation that somehow escapes us and begins to impact people around us. The, the very nature of reality around us is shifting because of the love of God. And sometimes that can be hard for us to, to really land on because it would seem that to have a perfect God, a God that we often imagine as, as distant and apart from this world, that God could look upon the mess that's being made, all of our frustrations that we have about the way this world works, all of our uh, anger directed toward the systems of oppression and violence that seems to overwhelm uh, our reality, it would seem that God would look about this. And if it makes us angry, that certainly it would make God angry. And if it makes us prone toward violent thinking, that it would, of course, make God prone toward violent thinking. And so we might imagine God treating this world like we would treat the first batch of pancakes that never seem to work out. Just get rid of it, throw it away, and start over again. But you see, what Paul is saying is that God's love is so overwhelming that it forces us to imagine a completely different sort of God that we are used to. You see, so much of, of I think, our objection to faith and religion is born out of this sense that God is mean, capricious, difficult to be with, someone that we are not allowed to approach, not the loving parent that we long to be comforted by, but instead an abusive parent who is waiting for us uh, with the belt in hand. Paul's going to say that, that instead God comes into this cycle and reality of death and will begin to transform it. And instead, through love and grace and mercy and compassion, life will be put where death once reigned. And that that life is found when God calls us out of death and into a resurrection sort of reality. And God is only able to do this because of the work that Jesus did by entering into this death and depression and wrath and having that invited upon himself, soaking all of it up so that it exists no more once resurrection happens. You see, we are no longer children of wrath, but instead we are called children of God. And this, again, requires us to imagine God as the parent that should be. You know, I know many of us did not grow up with parents that seemed to uh, confess love so easily, to show and demonstrate care for us, concern. Instead, they were prone to leave and disappear, and maybe stick $5 in a birthday card if they thought about it. But you see, the love of God as Father, which Paul is prone to use, uh, 
is a love that is transformative, that, that discovers within us all of the potential goodness that we have and draws that out because of the love that is shared. And so often we can imagine this love as being sort of this, this um, indirect, imminent sort of thing that just sort of flows from God because that's who God is. You know, if we don't want to imagine God as a wrathful God, we imagine God as sort of this soft-hearted, yet distant God who's just sort of generically lovable and loving. But that's not how Paul imagines God either. What Paul is going to say is that God's love is directed toward us, that it is intentionally put in front of us to call us and draw us out of this death and into this new life. That this is not just some generic love that fills the universe, but instead it is purposefully directed toward those who are most in need of this rescue and the salvation. This is the way that God is demonstrating love to us, is that God recognizes how broken and hurt and, and in need of care that we are, and then comes to us and rescues it. It is not just some wave that happens to roll over us, but instead it is strategically purposeful and aimed toward us. And this is the word we use for salvation, that we are rescued out of this death and decay and despair that often we don't know we are in, and instead brought up into the safety of God's side Paul says that we are lifted up to the right hand with Christ, that we are now in a place where we are protected with the authority of God. And so often when we think about that and, and we, we draw off some of the language that Paul is using, we imagine that salvation then must mean that we are saved from the very worst that we can imagine, which would be uh, a life in, in hell or death or, or the darkness that, that is there. And therefore, salvation must only mean that we get to go to heaven when we die, that we don't have to be afraid of going to hell anymore. And what we find as we read Paul is that's just not there at all. What instead we see is that the life and love and gifts of God's mercy and compassion are not something that we have to wait for on some edge of reality, but instead they are made available right now. That the salvation that God brings is something that comes to us immediately. It's not something we have to just wait for and hope for that one day when we die, everything will be okay. What Paul is going to say is that none of this happens through our own effort. That this sense of striving and clawing our way, of pursuing our own salvation to make it happen, well, that, that doesn't exist anymore. Instead, this is nothing but a gift of grace, a way of God demonstrating God's love to us in ways that, that we were blind to and therefore ignore, ignorant of, ignoring all the ways that God would show us love. Instead, God would make that evident to us in a way that would open our eyes and now we see a reality that we had not seen before. And again, that is not a reality that we have to wait for, but instead it is something given to us and so we say, well, if salvation then is not just waiting to go to heaven when I die, well, then what is it for? I think what we find is that Paul explains that, that the very nature of who we are shifts and changes. That Paul's going to use a word that talks about God's workmanship, God's craftsmanship, God's creative, beautiful artistry that will form us into something that is reflective of the creator that is beautiful and merciful is graceful and lovely and that is now who we are when we find christ's faithfulness to god in love and compassion overwhelming us and rescuing us and saving us that it works like we were before all this just words in a book a dictionary uh, just notes loosely formed on a page. And what God will do is step in and compose a poem, a story, a song, and add all of God's beauty and skill and talent and rescue this jumbled mess of confusion and put it into something that in itself is beautiful. That we now are a good work of God rather than this, uh, this mess of death and decay and brokenness. But you see, that work of art that God has now created in us in our salvation is not meant to simply sit on a shelf and wait until death. Paul's going to say that we are now made for good works, ordered and destined to be something that is able to capture God's mercy and compassion and therefore make it known to other people. Because the reality is that salvation is not just for us. 
Most of us, when we have come to faith, have come to faith because someone else has shared that story with us, has composed a piece, has opened up the book of their life and shown us just how compassionate and graceful that God is to them. And it allows us to see, well, if God can do that for them, it means that God can do it for me. That if God can forgive and love and restore even the most lonely, that God can do that for me. And so when we discover that, what God is saying we should not do is keep that to ourselves. Is to say, well, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven and it's fine now and I can just sort of ignore the hurt and pain of the world around me. No, what God says is that we have been transformed into a song, that we've been made beautiful and that that beauty has to be shared, that we each have a story that we can tell other people, a song that must be sung, that we are poems that will help to awaken the world of its own danger and of the way that God brings salvation to it. And so I hope that you would discover as you look back upon your own story, the ways that you might have been struggling, walking through your own shadow-filled valley, and the way that God's presence called you forward in that, rescued you from that, brought you out of death and into life so that that life might be given away to other people. This is the very nature of our calling, that we are saved not for ourselves, but we are saved in order to see the others around us come to find that God's love is meant for them, that God's grace is directed toward them, and that we are the way that God will make that known to the world. So I pray that you would find ways this week to make that known. Amen. prone to wonder, we may be prone to leave. What we know is that God is not, that God remains by our side no matter what. And so therefore we can turn our heart over to God and tell God to keep our heart close to God's own heart, that our love would overflow with the love of God, that we would find ourselves taking time this week to move beyond our own needs and recognize the needs of others, respond to those in ways that God would respond, knowing that it is God's love and beauty that flow through us as God's very own good work. I hope that you would find the way that God has crafted you into a beautiful piece of art so that you can recognize your own value and that you can extend God's value to others. So I hope that you go in peace knowing that God cares for you.